So I hope you all enjoy some time with Richard and John in Dialogos. So I, I, uh, I enjoyed your talk, so take that into consideration. But I was disappointed that you didn't give the talk that I thought you were going to give uh, from the abstract. Because, uh, you know, uh, I'm, uh, I'm also a, a deep reader of Nietzsche, and I take him as one of the prophets of the meaning crisis. He certainly, I think, in some ways, uh, presents himself that way. And I just, I mean, I'm not asking you to give a talk that you didn't give, but I'm wondering, um, what are your thoughts about that sort of Nietzschean take on you know, the death of God? Uh, and I'm always impressed by the fact that the madman pronounces that not to Christians, but to atheists in, when he goes into the marketplace. And he says, you know, you don't know what you've done. You don't, we're, we've, we've wiped away the sky. We're unchained from the sun. We're forever falling. And then he realizes that they can't understand what he's saying. And then, um, and I've always, I've often reflected on that. And of, of course, he's not giving some crypto argument for theism. He's trying to say something else. Um, and so, um, I, I'm wondering what, um, what you, what, what your thoughts are around that, because you had at least put some preliminary thought into um, wrestling with the question of existential meaning, um, and uh, I can see why that could. Um, also intersect with the important work you're doing on bioethics, especially around death, um, because many of the, I'm, so I'm very familiar with the meaning in life literature, the psychology around that, and one of the things that, that seems to ameliorate um, the challenge of that is um, a sense of meaning in life. There's some good evidence around that. Um, and so I just, I, I just wanted to open it up for you to uh, have a chance, and again, I know you don't have a prepared argument, and I, I'm not trying to catch you out or anything. I just wanted to give you an opportunity, a genuine opportunity. All right. So uh, John is referring to the, the, the title of the presentation uh, this morning for the presentation I didn't give. Yes. Um, so um, please keep in mind that uh, this event was delayed for a considerable period of time. A lot of yes. Time's gone by, and a lot of things have happened. So, um, sure, I, I, I can comment on that. Um, my reading of Nietzsche is, is this. He takes what he calls the death of God to be a, a historical event. It's something which is uh, happening in the 19th century when he was writing, but uh, he, I think he regarded himself as something of a prophet. Yes, very much. And that it would be the people of the 20th century who would really have to deal with the fallout, which mm. he talked about in terms of nihilism. Mm. And of course, nihilism, um, the loss of meaning, uh, the thought that uh, nothing matters, something which has been, um, I think, presented well in the literature of the 19th century. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, if God is dead, all is permitted, and so mm. on. So it's the catastrophe, which is the death of God, which is not just, um, he, he wasn't, I, I, I think, just uh, talking about the fact that um, the Christian religion is, is, is losing um, it, its power, um, it, that its time has passed, but that uh, we're talking about a civilizational era, which really began with Plato, mm -hmm. right? And that was mm -hmm. the, the two-tiered theory of reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, the platonic view of the world of being as opposed to the world of becoming. Mm -hmm. um, now Nietzsche is a critic of this, of course, because he yes. sees um, the Platonic view as a refutation or a denigration of life. Um, the idea is to move up the line toward uh, the form of good. Um, philosophy is a preparation for death, because at that point the soul can leave the body and dwell in unity mm -hmm. with the forms and so on. But the message there is really an abnegation of life. So in, in a sense, um, Nietzsche is glad that the sun is setting on this platonic Christian world order, Christianity being Platonism for the people, a sort of memorable phrase mm -hmm, mm -hmm. from Nietzsche. Um, however, um, um, the situation demands a new, uh, a, a, a new creator, um, the Ubermensch, mm -hmm. somebody can give meaning to the earth, 
uh, someone can give our civilization a direction without going back to a two-tiered world order, which yes. is a, uh, yeah. a devaluation of life. Um, I like the way, now, I, I, I'm not sure I buy all this, and I'll, I'll explain why. Sure. Um, I think uh, someone who uh, expressed it well was the, the Czech writer Milan Kundra, a, a novel entitled The Unbearable Lightness of Being. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the first page. Have you, have you read it? It's, I have it. it uh, it's uh, the <laughs> very first page. Yeah. Uh, which I, I've, read the, I've read the first page. So <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I think, if I remember correctly, uh, where he talks about um, the fact that if, if something happens only once, it might as well never have happened at all because it will eventually be forgotten, right? And that, that's true. I mean, I think of, uh, it was uh, Julian Barnes, a British writer, who said of the First World War graveyards, for example, that these huge cemeteries, someday they won't mean anything to us. The, the, the living connection with the time and those people um, will be lost. And somebody will say, it's time we turn these things back into farmland again. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Kundra uh, said, you know, there might have been um, a, a war on the continent of Africa in, say, the 12th century, we don't know about, in which case it doesn't matter. In the same way that if you ask people now, was Napoleon a good guy or a bad guy, they, they won't have an opinion on that because the, the sense of the time and the cause mm. ha has been lost. Um, now, I guess the, my, my thinking on that is that um, n what Nietzsche is offering um, as replacement for the Platonic Christian worldview is the thought of eternal recurrence because he's yes. trying to um, he's try, he's trying to think of a way uh, in which the, our our actions can be given significance. All right, so and so it sounds something like this. Um, and I guess there are different ways you can interpret it. It sounds like a, a kind of Kantian mm -hmm. imperative. Call it an existential imperative, maybe. When you're acting, act as if. Um, you are choosing for all time, and so you must live mm -hmm. the consequences of this choice mm -hmm. for all time. And that is a way of giving your actions weight or significance. The problem with that, for me, is that you know full well that it's just a hypothetical, it's a thought experiment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it has to, be, these things have to be believe to have any moral weight to them. So I like to compare uh, Nietzsche with, uh, uh, say, David Hume, who was an atheist and had embraced a secular worldview, uh, but didn't see uh, the loss of faith as a catastrophe, either, either personally or civilizationally. Mm -hmm. He did find the, the, the consequences of his thought somewhat depressing. And the solution to that is to play backgammon with his friends, go horseback riding, or a glass of claret. That would do. Mm -hmm. So that suggests to me, if you're comparing Hume with Nietzsche, Nietzsche is a deeply religious man who's reached this uh, crisis mm -hmm. point in terms of his own um, uh, uh, thinking. He, he, he simply cannot sustain faith in the, the, the Platonic Christian story anymore. Now, I, I guess I'm, I'm getting to the end of this. Uh, <laughs> I, find it immense, I find it very interesting so far. So. <laughs> to this little overview is that um, uh, when we're talking, uh, our actions have significance on a limited time scale. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have to be choosing for all time. It, it, it doesn't matter. Whether, it, there, there'll come a day when we're all gone. Right? And so none of us will remember what mm -hmm. others did. And mm -hmm. so the evil that we did uh, won't matter. That's true. But um, living in the here and now, the good and bad that we do is significant mm -hmm. on a local level. If I give you a ride to the hospital, I've done something good for you. you. In other words, you don't have to measure, measure the significance of your actions by eternity. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a mistake. And uh, I'd make the same claim about um, morality in general. You, you, you don't have to measure um, the goodness of what you do by an eternal standard of the good. Mm -hmm. um, it's enough to do good on a local 
level and a finite level. It's, it's still a good, if I, if I give you a ride to the hospital, I've done something good for, even though both of us will be gone someday. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, are you finished? Uh, yes, okay. Okay. <laughs> um, I have several comments on that. Um, first of all, I, I agree um, that um, the significance of our actions shouldn't be measured against everlastingness or something like that. And I mean, I, I think Thomas Nagel in The Absurd makes a very good argument. Um, if my actions are, don't matter to people a million years from now, then what people think a million years ago should not matter to me. The, the, the lack of significance is completely symmetrical. And so, uh, um, and he makes, a, he makes a whole bunch of arguments about, uh, to, to the effect that most of the purported arguments for nihilism actually aren't um, sort of logically valid arguments. And I, take it, I take it that's well said, um, but I, I have a couple of points. I mean, so outside of the Christian framework, you can see other solutions to that. Uh, one that easily comes to mind is Stoicism um, that says, no, 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 don't measure it horizontally, uh, narratively through the extent through time. Uh, measure it how deeply it connects to the depths of reality. So they, they propose a vertical depth, um, and, and that seems to track with the meaning in life literature, which is uh, people don't seem to measure meaning of life psychologically by the everlastingness of what they're doing. Though that's not, that doesn't come out as a primary uh, dimension. Um, they measure it in terms of um, are they connected to something that makes coherent sense? Does it have an existence and potentially a value independent of their own egocentric concerns? So it is meaningful to ask them, well, what would you like to exist in the universe even if you didn't? And they can say, oh, well, this, right? That's a meaningful thing. Mattering, they want to make a difference to something other than their egocentric concerns. And then realness, that whatever it is all of those other things are doing, they have to be real. They can't be illusory or a simulation or it's a, a, tr it's a trick. I sometimes do the, I do the experiment where, yeah, a thought experiment with, my, with, with some of my students and I'll say, suppose this happened to you when you turn 21 and your parents take you uh, in and they say, come here, come here, John, I'll use me because it's safe for me to use my name for me uh, because we, using names now is dangerous. So anyways, I, I, uh, uh, I, I want to show you something and uh, my parents, they're both dead, so it's also a safer example. Um, but then they take me to a hallway, and they push a button, and a door opens, and they go, they go in. And I'm asking my students to put themselves in this position. And the, you know, your parents say to you, you know, we were actually hired 21 years ago to have you by the government. And they, they show you all these files and these tapes. And they, they taught us what we should say to you and, 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 you know, and how to pretend to care about you and everything. And we're not going to change anything we're doing. We're just, just going to say all the same words. And, um, and, and, that, and that's it. And we can go back and just forget it. And, and I ask my students, well, how do you feel now? And they all say, well, horrible. <laughs> horrible. And it's like, but none of the behaviors are changing. Everything else. But, but, but because it's a simulation now, because the connectedness is within a simulation rather than a reality, they reject it. They'll do the same thing like this. So uh, the God replacement for our culture right now is romantic relationships, which is one of the great mistakes our culture is making. Um, imagine trying to make a romantic relationship with a fallible, broken human being carry the weight of God in history and culture. You're going to do that for me. It's a right, great idea. Um, so, <laughs> and I ask my students, how many of you are in like really satisfying romantic relationships? And they put their hands up. And I say, okay, th those of you who do, um, put your hand up again if you would like to know that your part partner was cheating on you even though that would completely destroy the relationship. And almost all of them put their hands back up. Because they don't, and, I, and, he, and, I, so, and then I ask him, Richard, and here's all my hard-bitten, nihilistic, postmodern students, <laughs> Why, why not? Well, because it isn't real, right? <laughs> right? And it's like, wow, you're really, re you're really ready to use that word right there, right? And so the, I'm po the point I'm making is these are just thought experiments that bear out in the in empirical literature. So I don't think, there's nothing in there about I need to be connected to something that will never pass away. 
That doesn't come up very much. It, but there is, so if, if you allow me to use a horizontal metaphor, that doesn't seem to matter too much to people. Like you can say to people, within five generations, they'll know, there won't be anybody that know, remembers you, and they'll go, I don't care about that. If that doesn't bother them too much. But if you say to them, it's not real, or you're not connected to something other than yourself, that really bothers them. That's really bothering. So I think, I think we should give up the idea of the everlasting. And Paul and Jonathan are going to get angry at me right now, but I'm just going to keep making this argument for a bit. And, and you see in Stoicism and Buddhism, and I would argue in Platonism, because I think Nietzsche gets played, Plato quite wrong. I think third wave Platonism has really made that case very well. Um, this. Now, now I'm coming around to my point. We have, t and notice what I'm doing, I'm doing this. And that's the metaphor that people use for this, other than extended for all time, depth of reality. And they're doing, they do this vertical thing. We have this prevalent metaphor, and it's bound in so many of our other metaphors for trying to talk about that in terms of an upper and a lower, a two worlds mythology. And so part of the way I talk about the meaning crisis is we inherited from the Axial Revolution this whole new way of talking uh, that emphasizes the vertical dimension. And you see it in Plato, you see it in the Stoics. But it got bound up with, as you said, with respect to Nietzsche, a two worlds mythology. And we are losing the two worlds as a plausible hypothesis about the structure of reality. But that doesn't mean we can throw away all of the practices by which we have tried to explore that vertical dimension of depth. And so that, to me, is a way of trying to understand the meaning crisis. How do we rehome those practices that gave us access to the vertical dimension that plausibly show up in increased measurements of meaning in life when we no longer have an ontology, at least those of us committed to a scientific worldview, we no longer have an ontology that legislates or at least legitimates the two worlds mythology that homes those practices. Does that make sense as a proposal? Uh, really, it really does. But a I, I, quick follow-up question then. Um, what's the meaning of meaning here? Is it, is it function? No, or no. Purpose? So, yeah, uh, so, so meaning is being used as a metaphor here, right, which is something. So the, the idea is there's something like semantic meaning, the way semantic meaning binds the elements of a sentence together and then binds me to the world so that truth is possible for me. There's something about how I am cognitively, existentially fitted to the world that binds the world together and binds me to the world in a way so that I can flourish within it in a meaningful, fa well, sorry, in a fashion that makes it worthwhile to keep living given all the suffering and failure in life. It, it, is that, okay, so Nietzsche again, yeah. uh, if you have a why anyhow is possible, that famous line. Is, is, so is that what we're talking about? I, I think that's what we're talking about. If you really broaden the why to not be something that is going to be answerable with sort of a propositional sentence, but more about, um, uh, you know, an older model of virtue, something that integrates beliefs, skills, states of mind, traits of character, so that one is properly comported towards the world. Very much, um, um, not uh, some important similarities to you know Heidegger's notions of authenticity that you're properly oriented uh, towards uh, being in an, in a way that supports your agency, especially in its human capacities for self-interpretation and um, self-transformation. Okay, so I'm having trouble cashing out meaning. In, in terms other than function or purpose. And I'm thinking of Aristotle and Nic Nicomachean ethics. Well, for example, let's use Aristotle then. So the, 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 the thing closer in Aristotle, in Aristotle to what I'm talking about isn't sort of um, the notion of function, but closer to what he has in the conformity theory of knowing, that there's some way in which the mind and reality are sharing and participating in a connectedness, a contact, 
Charles Taylor's idea about a contact epistemology uh, versus a representational epistemology. I, th I think I brought some Aristotle along with me. Okay. <laughs> That's kind of impressive. I can't pull anything out of my pocket that has a philosopher. I did, here it is. Okay. It's from the Nick and Keen Ethics. It's a famous line where he is talking about uh, the, fun the function of a man, right? He says, have the carpenter then and the tanner certain functions or activities and has man none? Is he born without a function or is eye, hand, foot in general each of the parts evidently has a function? May one lay it down that man similarly has a function apart from all these? And of course, these are rhetorical questions. Well, of course not. If the hand and the foot have a function, well, the man himself must have a function. And then, right. so he goes on to, to, to uh, fill that out. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, but okay, I guess the problem I'm objecting to is that, especially the Aristotelian notion of function is bound up with the teleology. And so if you, and given that evolution has removed teleology yes. and you're left with something like adaptivity and biologists will try to understand function non-teleologically in terms of adapted fittedness, then I'm okay with that if that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Okay, okay. Now, um, just for the record, um, I, I do worry about uh, what Nietzsche called the death god because mm. we seem to be running an experiment right now um, in moving towards secular society. And th this is something we haven't seen before. It all all culture societies have had, as far as I know, have had religion. And so this experiment this may not work, work out well. Yes. Um, Okay, then my, my question would be, um, given your sort of vertical sense rather than the horizontal, the distant set, uh, sense of meaning, how does re religion then provide that? Or, and, and maybe um, the, you know, the question I asked Jonathan this morning is, is religion one of the best ways or the best way of providing that? Oh, I'm the sorry. Poor, the poor guy's been talking no, I'm not, all day. I'm not laughing at you at all, Richard. <laughs> the point is there's a, there's a profound irony in you asking me that question. Um, um, well, you know, when they first invited me here, the, the idea was uh, where we're looking for common ground, right? Yep. Not debates, not arguing, which is good because a whole weekend's a long time to be fighting with people. So, I, no, no, well, uh, here, you know, here's this is actually an area, area of commonality. No, no, I, I agree. And I, I think your question is well placed, and there was nothing inappropriate of you asking it of me. It's it just put me it it puts me in a strange position. Um, uh, so, um, I want to I want to respond in good faith. <laughs> Pun there. I want to respond in good faith uh, to. Uh, your question. Um, it's not a, um, there's a sense in which the 50 hours of awakening from the meeting crisis is directed exactly to that question. Um, um, is, has religion been a place in which people have cultivated ecologies of practices that have allowed them to deal with the self-deceptive, self-destructive aspects of our cognition and enhance the senses of connectedness to themselves, to other people, to the world. And um, in a way that many cultures have called wisdom, has it done that? Has it honed that? Yes. Is there even current research about that right now? Yes. Uh, my RA has done pretty good research showing that if people are trying to cultivate wisdom, the people in, within the religious traditions do better than the secular people. Now, before you get all happy about that, um, there doesn't seem to be any significant di difference between the religions with respect to that success, which I have taken to mean that the propositional levels at the top is not the thing that is accounting for the success of the religions in helping cultivate wisdom. I think that's a reasonable interpretation. Uh, and that's convergent with a lot of other arguments. So I want to... Sorry, that's stupid, you don't care what I want. Um, I'm proposing that there is a lot to be learned in deep respect and good faith dialogue from the religions about how to home ecologies of practices 
such that people can viably reduce foolishness, self-deceptive, self-destructive behavior, enhance meaning in life, but that I am concerned, I'm not totally convinced, that's why I continue to talk so deeply with Paul and with Jonathan, but I'm concerned that the religions are so bound up in many ways, the legacy religions, and I would include Buddhism in this too, by the way, with a two worlds mythology that they are not capable of answering this particular problem that we're talking about, which is how do we rehome ecologies of practices that activate and give us access to the vertical dimension without having to buy into a two worlds mythology. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that they're not able to do that. So paradoxically, I talk about a religion that's not a religion. It's, it's a religion in the sense that it is serving a lot of the functionality that religion serves, but it doesn't have some of the central grammar that the two worlds mythologies that are found in the Axial Age religions. And we have now sort of taken as defining features of what a religion is. And so um, that is why I, I had to give you that very strange initial response, uh, because I, I also propose that working, what that working out what that means both theoretically and practically, I work with what you could call non-religious, not anti-religious, but non-religious emerging communities of practices that are creating these ecologies and having success and trying to figure out what's going on there. I, I work with those and um, I, I'm trying to understand exactly, well, what is that functionality? How can we afford it? Because the, one of the fastest growing demographics are the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. These are the people that declare they have no official re religious allegiance. Um, that doesn't mean that most of them are Sam Harris uh, type atheists. When you take a look at the demographics, most of them are seekers and they describe themselves with the very popular and utterly meaningless phrase, spiritual but not religious. And then I'm trying to figure out What's that? that? For me, that's just a placeholder. They're trying to articulate that they want these ecologies of practices. They don't want the religious framework. And I'm hoping that something like this, and I'm not, I'm not trying to set up, Jonathan, you shouldn't accuse me of that. I don't want to be the founder of a religion, and neither do I want to be the figurehead of a religion. And if, it's, if the job's offered to me and it involves limousines and cash, I still won't take it. Uh, so, um, but. I do think this is emerging, and, 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 and it's emerging very fast. These communities are trying to network together into a subculture. Um, and I think that is where we can plausibly see a way of life that could be of deep value to the nuns. That's my proposal. OK, another qu question then, and, and this is what I put to Jonathan this morning is can you have the goods of a religion without some kind of dogma, a story? Okay, so, uh, yeah, I, I, think that's a very, I think that's an excellent question. And part of it is to, it is to th understand. If there is, I'm ready to buy it, buy into it now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> well, no, no, but, but what I mean is, first of all, we have to remember that we, 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 we can't be too ethnocentric about the use of the term religion. The idea of this entity religion as something distinct and separable, th th there isn't e even a word for it in other cultures. So, uh, the, 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 right, and we have a sort of a very belief-centric notion of religion. We often will use the, a belief system as, um, as, uh, as a synonym uh, for religion. And f for me, if you take a look, um, you can see that in many other places, the creedal aspect of how people are trying to cultivate wisdom, depth, realness, real connectedness, um, is not primary. Um, instead, the, the religio, the practices of binding, that's what religio means, right? Um, uh, are central and are, are considered important. Now, that doesn't mean that people are willy-nilly ad hoc. They have something much more like an orthopraxy than an orthodoxy. They're like, you know, and so for example, uh, you know, 
the, Taoism is much more like that, and I've been doing Taoist practices for near, nearly three decades. And in one way you can describe Taoism, it's the religion of flow. It's the religion that gets you into the flow state, and the flow state is when you feel this powerful depth and connectedness, and your agency is enhanced, and your egocentrism goes away, and, it, and boy, does it percolate through your life, and, and you find it just changing things. Is that a religion? I don't know. I was just going to ask you that. Yeah, exactly. And I think, so for me, my answer is yes and no. It's a religion in the sense that it is a powerful set of an ecology of practices, a complex ritual that brings about a profound transformation that discloses aspects of myself and the world and affords me transforming in relation to that disclosure. But does it commit me to, uh, you know, a, a, a complex set of doctrines. There's this stuff about the Tao, but the Tao that can be spoken of is not the Tao. And, and, like, and, and so the doctrine is this undermining thing. I'm not here to advocate Taoism, by the way. That's not what I'm trying to do. Um, but w what I am arguing is, is Taoism a religion? I think, can I, can you, is Taoism really helping people reduce foolishness, enhance connectedness, improve agency, but all the stuff, yes. Can it lead to powerful, mystical, or transformative experiences? You better believe it. Reliable. Does it make real physiological and cognitive differences in people? Yes. But is it a religion in the way that we've come to think of religion? I, and so for me, there are things that in that sense, are religions but not religions. And I'm not saying, I'm not, one more time, I'm not saying Taoism is the answer, but it means that I'm not talking about an empty category. I'm talking about a possibility of something here. Okay, so I, 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 I think um, I, I'm in agreement when you're talking about looking at religion as a belief system. And yeah. I, it's typically what philosophers do, right? Yes, yeah. They look at religions as a set of propositions. Which uh, is a, it, yeah, yeah, are yeah. these reasonable to believe? Yeah, yeah. And religions typically don't come off very well when you do that. With yes. it. And the newer the religion is, the worse it is. I see Scientology or mm -hmm. Mormonism or something. I mean, the, the stories, right? Yeah. But, uh, of course, religions work in other ways and do other things. Yes. Right? So it's the collective participation in ritual, for example, which is very effective in building a sense of unity and, and community, all the social goods and psychological goods come of that. And I think once you see that, it may not matter. The dogma may be irrelevant. Um, are, is that a break? Uh, okay, or? I'll take a breather if you want. No, 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 I, I don't want to impose, but uh, so f again, um, uh, one of the things I've been arguing as a cognitive scientist coming out of 4E cognition, which by the way is deeply influenced by Heidegger, Mar Marleau-Ponty, et cetera, is the idea that there are different ways of knowing. There's not only propositional knowing that, there's procedural knowing how, there's perspectival knowing what it's like, there's participatory knowing, which is to have the agent arena relationship that opens up the very affordance of uh, of cognition, and th these have different kinds of memory associated with them, they have different normative uh, standards associated with them, um, and, and, and they result in different things. Procedural knowledge doesn't result in beliefs, it results in skills. Perspectival knowledge doesn't result in beliefs or skills, it results in perspectives. Uh, participatory knowledge results in identities, roles, etc. Um, and I think that religio, works very well at the non-propositional level. That's the first proposal. And then the second proposal is, that is most of where the connectedness that drives meaning in life is actually being generated. And so that religion, insofar as it's in the service of religio and not credo, uh, can make a very good claim, to go back to the empirical research, for being a place for training wisdom, if what we mean by wisdom is the enhancement of the non-propositional ways in which we are affording meaning-making. Um, and like you, I think, I tend to get very, um, I get very hesitant when we move up to the propositional level 
because of the, the pluralism argument. Uh, we have all these different belief systems. They can't all possibly be true. We don't seem to have any standard beyond them by which we can compare them or evaluate them. And then what typically happens is most of the comparisons drop down to the non-propositional level, either explicitly or implicitly, to try and say this is why this is better, this is why this is better, this is why this is better. Um, and so I guess um, I, I'm proposing that religion is particularly good at enhancing non-propositional knowing and that that non-propositional knowing is where most of the work of meaning in the sense we've been talking about here as religio, of bindingness and connectedness, is actually taking place. So if we throw out the propositional bathwater, we're going to throw out the baby that allows us to cultivate a lot of wisdom. But how do we do that without Committing, an alle committing our allegiance to the propositional. Did that make sense? Um, years ago, I was a big fan of Joseph Campbell. Read a lot of his works, and of course, uh, he, he suggested that we need a new mythology, right? Yes. It, a replacement uh, mythology. And he suggested that the Apollo astronauts might be the questing heroes of the 20th century. Yeah. And it, it, of course, um, I, I think most people could probably name more Star Trek characters than they could Apollo astronauts. I mean, it, it just wasn't a plausible, uh, it, it wasn't a plausible mm -hmm. uh, uh, theory. But when more importantly, the, the mythologies of the past weren't mythologies. No. Right. So in, in, in the modern, we think of mythology as a story, a myth, something which is false, that um, humanity in its childhood took seriously, but yeah, we're yeah. sophisticated now, yeah. that kind of thing. So for a new mythology to um, allow the social goods or psychological goods that we're talking about, it would have to be believed and not... And not um, recognized as a myth. Well, yeah and no. So first of all, um, yeah, I agree with you. Myths aren't, uh, aren't stories about the ancient past uh, that we no longer believe because we have science. Uh, Campbell and Jung, right, and Jordan Peterson. Um, you know, myths are stories about, they're prophetic in the biblical sense, not as foretelling the future, but as getting us to become aware of profound patterns that are pertinent and that have been forgotten. Um, that's Campbell's thesis in a nutshell and Jung's thesis in a nutshell. And I think there's something valuable about that. And then I put that together with Lerman's work, How God Becomes Real, one of the best um, cognitive anthropologists around. And she talks about these three different senses of real. And she talks about, okay, I'm, I'm, I just want to talk about this. And for the Christians here, I'm, I'm not trying to in any way undermine your Christianity I'm really, I really don't like that. That's not what I want to do. But she talks about the way, and you'll see why I said what I gave that preamble. She talks about the way Jesus is, the Jesus is real is different, uh, uh, different from how the table is objectively real, or my pain is subjectively real. And she says Jesus is not real in either one of those ways. Um, and she proposes this third way in which Jesus uh, is real. Um, and I think th that is properly the domain of myth. And for me, that's the transjective. That's that which binds the subjective and the objective together. It's that which creates affordances between the organism and the environment. The graspability of the cup is not in the cup, nor is it in my hand, but in a real relationship. The adaptivity of the shark is not in the shark or in the water, but in the relationship between them. Um, and so I think in this, what Lerman is saying is that the, the Jesus is real, not subjectively or objectively, but transjectively. Matt Rossano argues something very similar in Supernatural Selection. Um, and there's a lot of things that are real in that important way. And I think Heidegger's notion of Alethea 
is that kind of notion actually as well. Um, and so you can have very profound versions of this, some less profound. And I think myths work that way. I think myths don't have to be believed in our Cartesian sense um, of asserting a proposition. I, I think they, they, they work insofar as they really fit us to those pertinent patterns. So let me give you an example from my own life. I've, tra I've tried to adopt the Socratic way of life, and I don't just mean as some sort of deeply, profoundly. Am I convinced that the Socrates of Plato is a historically accurate portrayal? No. But does it connect me to what's going on in Plato or Socrates and how they're merged together such that my life continues to be profoundly enriched and transformed? Yes. And in that way, Socrates is real to me. But that's not the same thing as saying it's just a subjective thing or Socrates is objectively real uh, because it's something that I can get wrong. It's something I can be mistaken about. And therefore, there is a normativity to it. And that's how I think uh, myths have to be. Now, I think uh, I would say on your behalf, back to me, <laughs> sorry, that's a weird thing to do. So maybe that's a good, uh, uh, John, but then that surely means that myths have to emerge in a really different way. I don't think we can just, and I think Campbell would agree, we can't just, here's our new myth, I'm just going to write a myth. Myths can't, if I, if I decide to write a myth, I will completely fail in, in generating a myth. If I wait, I'm going to wait till reality gives me a myth. But I think about something like Moby Dick. Did, did L. Ron Hubbard not do just that? I mean, he was a science fiction writer before he became a religious leader. Yeah, but the, but the, 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 the thing about that is exactly the dysfunctionality, right? Uh, he, he created it, and he doesn't, it doesn't actually... I don't want to get too much into critiquing Scientology. <laughs> but it doesn't plug into anything. I mean, it's, it's not subjectively the case. It's clearly not objectively real. You know, Xenu and all that stuff, that's, that makes no sense. And yet, it doesn't seem to also make its adherence wiser, um, as far as I can tell. And for me, given what I've already argued, the important question to ask a myth is not, is it true or false? Is it does it reliably make people who partake in it wiser? That's the question I would ask. So I guess what I'm saying is the question, the harder question, I agree with you totally. I, I, I like to use the Greek word mythos so, as to distinguish from myth because of the current connotation and even denotation, right? Um, so we can't make mythos, uh, even though romanticism sort of tried that really hard. Maybe we can just make art, and it'll just do that for us, right? Um, and we can't just wait for it. And we somehow have to participate in its self-emergence. And that goes back to stuff we were saying earlier about this sort of, you know, Slingerland's book, Trying Not to Try. How do, I get, how do I get into that place? Uh, we were talking about it downstairs when we were asked that question. Um, and so for me, it's like the difficult question, and then I'll shut up, uh, is how can we properly dispose ourselves so that we can participate in the emergence of myth? And the proposal I've made about that is that we can try and get very powerful processes of dialogos that give us access to the collective intelligence of distributed cognition in a powerful and palpable way. And these are also emerging things. Uh, Taylor Barrett here, one of the people that has been part of the emergence of the circling practice as a new practice that does this. And you can see mythology being born in these practices. No one person does anything, but the circling is going on, and they get a sense of the we space that's not being made by you or me, 
but all of us, and it's, and it's leading us in a place, and they start to use religious languages regardless of whether they came from a secular or religious background. And you can see a new way, a new, a new language, even that language I just used, the we space, as a term, a mythological term, a mythos term, not a myth term, but a mythological term, trying to, you can see a myth emerging, I, well, I'm proposing that right here, right? I just want to check. Taylor, is that fair what I'm saying? Yeah. There we go, okay. <laughs> Okay, before we run out of time, I, I, I've got to take us in a different direction. For Please. That. I mean, talk about the meaning crisis. And I, I do have reservations about talking about a crisis. Sure. For, for example, you know, Heidegger talked about the, 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 as a crisis, the forgetfulness of being. And I, I've never been clear what the forgetfulness of being is. Sure. But people tend to cash it out to whatever was happening at the time. Okay, it could be the rise of fascism in the 30s, environmental problems. They see it as confirmation mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I, I mean, here's the worry, is that um, we never face one crisis, but it's many. And, and the individual crises have particular solutions. Sure. But not the solution to the problem of forgetfulness of being, whatever that is. Sure. And, and so, I mean, Heidegger was sort of drawing on the, the cri crisis in Marburg theology. Mm -hmm. and so, mm -hmm. it, so he it adapted that idea to his own purposes. Um, so I think I, I, in any era in human history, there are going to be problems. Sure. Issue, which people could talk about in terms of a crisis. It's a turning point, right? Kairos, yeah. Um, so maybe we focus on this large, the idea of crisis writ large, at the expense of actually addressing problems, on a, the individual problems on a smaller scale, which actually have yeah, that, I solutions think. which are easier to apply. So that's, that, I, I don't know if I'm being clear, no, 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 that's but good. That's, that's, good. That's, that's the worry that I have. That's a, it's a good worry. Um, uh, first of all, the, the, although there's a single adjective, the meaning crisis, it's not meant to be a single causal thing. It's meant to be a dynamical system of many different factors interacting very powerfully. Um, and the problem with our articles is they don't give us an article for talking about that kind of entity. Um, so what I would say is what I'm trying to put my finger on with the meaning crisis is the cultural cognitive ability to find oneself homed in the cosmos, which would be the opposite of nihilism, and that our, our culture in general is moving not towards a cosmic home, but away from it, nihilism and the nuns, etc. And that that puts us into a profound kind of scarcity mentality. Um, so if we take it that meaning is a substantial need, and I, 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 there's, I think, a ton of psychological literature that really supports that, so I'm not going to argue for that um, extensively here. And then you have the literature, the scarcity mentality literature, which is whenever you put human beings in a scarcity about one of their needs, it has the result of making them short-term thinkers, uh, rigid thinkers, and much more prone to cognitive bias in their thinking. So if there is a meaning scarcity in the way I've described, that it is putting us into a scarcity mentality at a very fundamental level of how we connect to ourselves, the world, and other people, that then reduces the kind of cognitive flexibility, depth, and expansiveness we need in order to respond to all of the X risk factors that we're facing. That's what I'm trying to put my finger on by this term, the meaning crisis. Excellent. Thank you. Since um, th this is probably the last time I'll uh, chance to talk to you, but just want to thank everybody for coming. I've had some terrific conversations the people over the weekend. 
I really appreciate John taking the time to come. You're, you're chair of your department, right? Pardon me? Are you chair of your department? I, I'm, well, yeah, I'm chair of the program, yeah. Chair of the program. I, I, I imagine it was difficult to get away for this length of time, right? <laughs> uh, the beginning of the semester. Yeah, yep. So yeah, I, I had to, I, 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 <laughs> I, I crammed a lot into the days before I came here so that I could come here, yes. Yeah, so that... But it's difficult for you to be here, so I really appreciate you coming. I am really glad you're here. You, you, uh, you must feel like in some ways you, they dropped you off in intellectual Papua New Guinea or something, and you're like, what the heck? What, what are these strange customs and these strange languages, and why, why, why do these people not orient the way? Uh, so I, 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 like I admire, first of all, your patience and your graciousness and your willingness to engage in good faith, and that's come through. Uh, it's, 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 it's good getting to know you. Thank you.